wonder if I don't walk in front of the camera and just teach, would it be, would people like freak out or? Nobody freaks out with me anymore, do they? It's expected. Well, it's good to have everybody here tonight. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I kind of figured we'd be down to a dozen people considering the key. Uh, of course, you probably left your home to come in here thinking, we'll go to church and it'll be nice and cool and air conditioning. Ah! You brought your sweater. You ain't gonna need no sweater tonight. Um, I don't know how much of our area went down, but I know school, daycare was down, we were down. I mean, it, that's twice in a week now. Um, so that's kind of an unusual thing for us around here, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I, you know, that's what I'm thinking. People are going crazy with electric. It's probably just overloaded. Um, but we're up. We came back up about 5.30, so this is as cool as it's probably going to get. Again, if you get too hot, have the person on your left or right blow on you, and you'll feel much better. And uh, we'll continue with the study. So it's good to have you here and those who are watching you from home. Did you have your water? Huh? Did you have your water? Ice. That's my water. Garrett? You better behave. Yeah. You're going to get ice. <laughs> He's hoping. He'll be a smart mouth all night now. This yeah, whole night I'll go on an IV. How's the boys do in um, soccer? That's all right. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Uh huh. All right, gang, let's start with a word of prayer and then let's take a look at Revelation 14 to 144,000 in the Lamb of God. For who the sinners. Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this night. And Lord, another great chapter here in Revelation. And um, we keep moving through it. Well, one chapter at a time, one step at a time. Hopefully, gleaning and learning more and more as we go. And I pray, Father, that the overall overarching lesson would be that of hope that we have in Christ Jesus, regardless of what the end looks like. And right now, Lord, as we watch the news and we listen to everything going on, uh, uh, we and a lot of people wonder where the hope for the future is. Well, we have it in Jesus. And I hope that word goes far beyond the walls here and what the internet can carry. So that people would start looking to you and not fretting over the end and what it might look like. So, Father, I pray your blessings upon this night as we take a peek into heaven at the 144,000 and the song of the Lamb of God. Bless this night and all that we do, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, open up to Revelation chapter 14, or you should have it on your papers. I also put, I, I don't, I've been doing this more and more, but on the back of your papers, you'll have a list. Of scriptures that I will refer to. Uh, sometimes we get a little lost on where I'm going, and I understand that because I tend to be a traveler, and you never know where I'm going to end up. And so I put these down so you can go back and re-reference them later. Um, the more and more I teach Revelation, and who knows if I'll teach it again somewhere down the line, more likely I will. But I'm trying to add more and more stuff. So those, I mean, like Donna has a notebook that weighs about 34 pounds now with all the information in it. Last year, two, you got two notebooks now? My goodness, girl. And then last time I taught it, you had one that weighed 28 pounds. So she added six more pounds of information to it. So every time, hopefully, and I hope you do the same. I hope that you take this and, and you learn from it, but also uh, continue to study it because um, you know, I a lot of people believe we're seeing end times right now. Um, and I think there's a lot of things pointing to it. Um, but I still think that there are those things that, that have to be done. And, and what has to be done is the people who are called by my name need to rise up and um, quit worrying about whether people think that you're prejudiced or creepy or freaky or retarded or, excuse me, or lacking in brain power. Um, you know, they do think most Christians are a little, and um, if they watch me any amount of time, then I probably solidified that. But um, it's important that we who are called by his name begin to do the things that we were supposed to be doing from the get-go. And as we see our world flip upside down, now is a great time for that. Amen? So let's take a look at this. Verses 1 through 5 of Revelation 14. Then I looked, and there before
before me was the lamb standing on Mount Zion. Where was he standing last time? Last time we saw him, where was he standing? Way back in Revelation 5. On the throne when he took the scroll, remember? That was the last time we saw him standing. Here he's standing on Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard the sound of a, from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters and a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of a harpist playing their harps. It was like that of a harpist playing their harps. You ever wonder where people got the idea angels play harps? This is part of, of where they got that idea from. And they sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Okay? This, we'll talk about that in a moment because I know there's a lot of interesting thought on this. These are those who did not defile themselves with women. That was great timing, Amber. Amber. <laughs> I, at first, I thought Robin may have poked her or something. I, I didn't. I will not read that again. Okay? Amber, that timing on that was excellent. That was, that was. Welcome, welcome to Wednesday nights. Yeah, poker. I'm not reading it again, Robin, so you won't have to poke her. For they kept themselves pure. They followed the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased among men and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. 144,000 blameless individuals who have not defiled themselves. And there is no lies in their mouths. Out of 8 billion people in our world today, how hard would it be? A hundred, let alone 144,000. But that's an interesting concept. And remember, John, who at the time has no recollection or no knowledge of how many people are globally in our world. His, his world at this point is about this big. Okay, it's just very small. It's all he can see, all he can hear from and, and talk with. Um, it's no bigger than that. Today, we look at our globe and we can literally see 8 billion people. Existing Back then, that was impossible. We talked about that a few weeks ago. So we begin in, in verse 1. We begin with a vivid scene. John said, I look and there before me. Now, we have to understand this is not just a, a, an, an image or a portrayal of something. Here he is again like he was at the very beginning. Remember at the beginning when he first entered and he said, I'm not the body anymore and the spirit. And now I see before me where he's in the same place now. He's in the same place where he's with his, sister, with his own eyes. And he said, the lamb, who we know is Jesus, is standing, standing on Mount Zion. Now, this is an interesting, uh, interesting statement, especially if you study um, Isaiah. Isaiah 63 talks about Mount Zion. And today we hear the word Zion, and we hear that word typically affiliated with the Israel when we talk about Zion, but this, this has a broader reach to it, and that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. This, this word, Mount Zion, saying on Mount Zion, literally translates to the, the deliverer has come, and he doesn't just come to one people, he comes to all people. In Joel chapter 2, verse 32, it's on the back of your papers, it says, for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said. Even among the survivors, even amongst the survivors, I, I love that statement. Even amongst those who, have, who are still in the tribulation period. The survivors whom the Lord called. Okay, very interesting statement there in the book of Joel. And we know Joel has to, has to deal with the sin of Israel, the sin of, of mankind, and the need for deliverance. And so John's saying, here I'm standing, and I'm looking at this lamb, and I'm realizing.
realizing that he has come not only for Jerusalem, but he's come for all people. He's come for the Gentiles as well. He has called them by name. Yes, Israel, they're his people. He is their God. But whenever we as Gentiles, once we accept Jesus Christ, we are, we are grafted in. So with Jesus, with Jesus, 144,000 representing the faithful remnant, the faithful remnant. This is a tough word right here. From the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, before Robin poked Amber, we heard that statement about undefiled, that they were undefiled with women. So most people would say that this is probably the priesthood that we're seeing. The only, the only problem I have with that is, according to 1 Peter, we are the priesthood. All those who believe upon Jesus Christ. So the only thing that we can reconcile with is that these are the individuals that we talked about before. When God took the, the Israel and he moves them out into a desert place, and then there are Gentiles who are amongst them who do know the word of God through Jesus Christ. And these are the ones, excuse me, who are testifying and bearing witness to what Jesus had done for all people, including Jerusalem and Mount, and, and Mount Zion being the rest of the people. So his deliverance didn't come for one people. It came for all people. Israel was so caught up in the idea that Jesus was still to come, the Messiah was still to come, the Savior was still to come. For them, his people, his children, not realizing that he had a far greater reach. Verse 2 says, I heard a sound. Now, this is interesting because I had to flash back to another chapter here, which we'll do in just a moment. Another unidentified voice of divine origin that calls out. In verse 2, it says, I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like the loud peal of thunder. That was a description of God's throne, if you remember back in the early part of Revelation. But this is not God. This isn't the sound of God's voice. It's the sound of a divine voice. That's why they use these, um, the same words, the loud peal of thunder and the rushing waters. And so it's a threefold figure of speech here. Number one, A, roar of rushing water, okay? From Revelation 1, verse 15, it says his voice was like the sound of rushing water. So we know that this is coming from a divine place. This is coming from the instruction of God himself, from the throne of God, who the rivers of living water run from, rush from, and a loud peal of thunder. Now, here's where it gets a little different. In, verse, in chapter 6, verse 1, if we go back, because what was, is, and what is, will be. I watched as the lamb over the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a loud, in a voice like thunder, come. Okay? So now we know it's a divine presence, a divine origin. We know it's from the throne of God. And we realize that at the throne of God, there are seraphims that circle day and night, day and night. And they say what? The Lord God Almighty he was and is. And guess what, folks? He's coming. He's coming. So it's one of the angels that is proclaiming this. One of the angels is making the statement. This isn't God. This isn't Jesus. This is the angels announcing, okay, here he comes. And so that's what we see here with this loud peal of thunder. The idea is an angel. And he goes on and says, like that of a harpist playing their harps. So here's, here's the image he's painting for us. He's looking down and he's realizing that the world is in chaos. He's realizing creation is in chaos. And he's looking at this and he's realizing that Jesus here he comes, okay, he's coming for his people, but he's also coming for as a deliverer, okay? When you come as a deliverer, you're not floating on a cloud, you don't have baby angel wings and a diaper, okay? He's coming as a warrior, he's coming as the lion, is what 
was coming at. A deliverer is known as a warrior, okay? Not, not, a, not as a song. And so in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of all this is going on, this loud roar and peals represents a harmonious tone in the midst of chaos. Um, I love, I, I really, really enjoy all kinds of music. And um, I have my preferences, but I like, there's some music that I love to hear. And that really brings a sense of calm. Harp is one of those. A harp, man, if you have a person who knows how to play a harp, it's the tones and the sounds that emanate from that are, are amazingly peaceful, amazingly harmonious, and that's the image that John's trying to paint for us. Um, you know, back then they did not have a synthesizer or keyboards and things like that, so it wasn't like he was using something that we use on Sunday. I mean, we use a synthesizer and, and a, uh, keyboards to help the atmosphere. And that's what he was, he was recommending. He said, this is the sound of angels playing harps. So in the midst of this chaos, there was harmonious sounds. There was a peace that was emanating in the midst of chaos. And that's what we're looking for in the world today. That's what the world is. They're trying to find peace in the midst of all the chaos. Sadly, they look to the church, they look to the believers, and they see our lives in chaos as well. So they're running around trying to figure out who has this truth. Now think about it. This is part of the plan. This is part of the enemy's plan. Because everybody's running around looking for truth, looking for peace, you can watch any news station anytime you want, and they're always talking about peace in the Middle East, peace all around the world, peace, but they never include Jesus. Yeah, the Prince of Peace. The only one that can bring peace. John tells us he is the only one that can give you peace. So everybody's running around trying to figure out how to get us into a peace plan, not realizing there is a plan. There's been a plan. There always was. And so the enemy is using that right now, which will, again, as we talked about last week, imagine this. Imagine the world is such chaos, and we're still teetering on that now, that a great spiritual leader arises and brings forth peace. And millions and millions and millions of people follow what he says. Peace then comes. The ushering in of the false prophet and the Antichrist is a part of this process. And so Jesus, in the midst of this chaos, is bringing those harmonious tones. He's bringing in the midst of that peace, in the midst of all the chaos. They were singing a new song. This is, this is interesting to me. Because now, let's, here, let me paint the picture for you. The church, those who believe in Jesus Christ, they're raptured, gone. Audio, see you later. Okay, we're in the last three and a half years. God takes his people, Israel, and he moves them out to a desert place. And he surrounds them with protection. And the only ones that can speak into their lives are the ones who knew the word to begin with, but never truly accepted it. And so these people, they're over there. So now... What we have left here is individuals who are going to receive salvation in the last three and a half years without the luxury of the church or its people. So what is the new song that they're singing? It is one of salvation because they don't know this song. How many songs? Have you ever stop and ask yourself how many songs we sing? I don't care if you're if you're a uh, hymnal person or if you're a uh, contemporary or progressive individual when it comes to music, um, church music, all of it sings about Jesus Christ, our Savior. Okay? But if you don't believe in Jesus, then you don't believe in the song. And you can't be singing the song. So now the church is gone, the people are removed. These individuals who are saved, they are saved 
and sing this new song. I wonder if in this song it's you were right, we were wrong. You had the answer, we were stupid. I mean, I wonder what the words are going to be because they've lived how many hundreds and yes, thousands of years and never once looked to Jesus for salvation. So this 144,000, they sing this new song of salvation. They were the 144,000. They did not know the song because they did not know Jesus. Very simple answer right there. So what song was sung? Well, we know what song is being sang. I just, I just asked that question. I just wonder what the verses are, okay? I'm sure they got the chorus now. But according to Revelations 5, 9, here it is on the back of the papers, and they sang a new song. This is way back in Revelation 5. Remember that? After John discovers he who sits on the throne, they sing a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. With your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. There it is. There's the nations that he's pulling together, 144,000. Now, part of the, uh, part of my, I hate to say my belief, but part of my uh, reconciling the passages is that there are, uh, there is one particular group of individuals, faithful followers, that believe there's only 144,000 that will be saved, period. Um, Dennis, one of my, my close friends, he used to invite them in to find out which number they were. Uh, because there's so many of them. There's 2.7 million, I believe, 2.75 million believers in that embodiment. Yet they, they teach only 144,000 are going to be saved out of 8 billion. Well, what they don't realize is that's at the end of time. That's after everything's all said and done, and God has sifted. Remember how he sifts the ground and he separates the sheep from the goats? This is after the sifting this begins. And these people recognize that redemption came because Jesus had already come. And that, that's, the, that's what we see here being the same. Revelation 5, 9, now in Revelation 14. In your in a theater near you. Verse 4 tells us the three traits or characteristics of the 144,000. They did not defile themselves with women. They were virgins. Second Corinthians. I want to read this to you. Oh, good thing I didn't even put it on there. Um, actually, I think that's still in Second Corinthians. I hope you will put up with me a, uh, in a little foolishness. Yes, Please put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin. Now, don't poke her again, because we're not, this is not this is not a comment on what we do to reproduce. It's not the comment. The comment was based upon a person who had other gods. These individuals had no other gods. So they didn't worship other gods. They didn't have idols of other gods. They were basically nomads. They had no connection to nothing. And so this, when he makes this undefiled as a virgin, he's talking about they had no other gods but him. Okay, so that's how that clears up. Some people, I, I, it's been comical to hear people talk about and again, I said this a minute ago. Well, they were part of the moral priesthood. Well, according to First Peter, so are we. So that kind of eliminates that idea. That's why the Bible is so important to understand um, all the way the tentacles reach. Because you can't get trapped in an idea that has no support to it. And so what I try to do is I try to bring it. I'm not telling you what to believe or how to believe it. I'm just bringing you the tentacles, showing you how it connects. Um, when I was when I was raising up as a youth pastor, um, individuals for ministry, and quite a few of them have ended up in ministry today. But I haven't done youth ministry in fifteen years. Oh man, 
24 years, a um, long time ago. Um, but one of the things I used to tell them was, if you're gonna make a statement, make sure you can support it. Don't, don't just make a statement about God, don't make a statement about Jesus Christ, don't make a statement about spiritual things unless you can support it. Because this is the truth that sets people free. This is the truth that brings life and salvation. And what I didn't realize at the time was I unleashed little monsters. And so that summer at camp, um, there's always a time where you go to workshops and, and other people teach your kids from a different viewpoint to kind of expand and enlighten. And um, I remember one, Kevin was teaching and he made a statement and one of my kids said, well, where'd you find that at? And he said, what? And they said, where did you find that at? Because in my Bible, this, and he went to the passage, says this. I'm not telling you you're wrong. I'm just saying, where did you find that so I can add it to my knowledge? And he wasn't prepared for anybody to ask him this question. That's why I do this sheet. Okay? Everyone should just walk out of here and say, Captain Dave West said. I, no, I don't want you to know that. And so that happened again. And again, and again, and that night he came to me and said, David, he said, will you please ask your kids to stay out of my workshop? He said, I said, just do the work. Give them the support. If you, if you make a statement, make sure you can support it. If you can't support it, don't say it. Because I don't want them learning like that. That whatever you say is right because I'm a Christian. No, that's not, that's not the case. Know what you're saying. That's why I gave you those little... Salvation cards you put in your Bible. That's the reason. You don't have to memorize all that. Show them. Here's what God's word says. Not mine. His word. So it's important to remember that and do that. The second thing is they followed the lamb wherever he went. Um, nothing was consistent. His life was completely out of the ordinary. Would we or are we willing to father, follow wherever he would be? That's the question here. Um, today, what do we do when someone says, hey, let's go do this? Oh, what are we going to do? Where's it at? Who's going to be there? What are we going to do? How's it going to look? What's the end result? I mean, man, we are so, what's at the end of the day? I mean, we are so, we can't just follow. We can't just go. We just can't do. We have to know all these things. Is this 144,000 like the disciples? And even the disciples, didn't they do that? Huh? They they walking with Jesus. Where are we going now? How are we doing that? Why are we doing that? Are you sure we can do that? I mean, they were constantly questioning him. These 144,000 at this point in time, but remember, they had already lived their life in denial. And at this point, reality had really hit them right between the eyes. Jesus, wherever you go, I will follow. The last thing is they were purchased from among men, among the world. They were the first fruits. Purchased from the world indicates that they were those who were left behind. Okay? So again, the separation. Church is gone. Israel is protected. These are the folks that are left behind. And now, though they are followers of Jesus, their beliefs were absolutely cost them their lives. The description here in verse 5 is of honesty as a characteristic within the believers from the end time harvest. No lies were found within them. I mean, how many times, how many weeks have I talked about this and mentioned it? When the rapture happens, those people that were left behind it went to church, studied the Bible, went to Bible study, said a few prayers, went to VBS, held out with VBS. Met with our Wednesday night group, went even our senior adult group. They were there, but they never personally accepted Jesus. And we know what Matthew 7 says about that. We know what Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says about that. They never made it personal. This becomes very personal for them. You can't threaten them with their lives. You can't. You can't call them haters. You can't call them prejudiced. 
You can't slander or slam them at this point because at this point, they know and they don't care. They don't care. And we've seen examples of those martyrs throughout history, haven't we? Martyrs just like that who knew in their knowing what they know. They didn't care if their life was called upon the line because they knew. And they knew the worst thing that could happen for them Verse 6. Then I saw another angel. Again, this solidifies the idea that it was one angel already. Okay? That the loud voice, remember the thunder? John said, Then I saw another angel flying in midair. And where did these angels fly? Above the head of God himself. And he had an eternal gospel proclaimed to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory. Because the hour of his judgment has come. Not as on his way, has now come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the seas and the springs of water. Verse 8 A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Verse 10, 9. A third angel appeared. Followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast or his image or receives his mark on the forehead or on his hand, he too will drink from the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever and ever. Here's another description of what I talked about three weeks ago in my Sunday message. The doctrine of hell. It is a doctrine. It is a real place. Each and every one of us are eternal beings because we're made in the image of God and we'll spend eternity somewhere. Somewhere. Um, there is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast in his image and for anyone who receives the mark Okay, so one angel has already proclaimed, here he comes, all right? Now we look at these, and I named them angel one, two, and three because the first one is already spoke, and we know how many seraphim flew above the head of God. Okay. So angel one proclaims the gospel one last time, last chance for repentance. This is it, last chance. Angel 2 proclaims all who do not repent are now enemies of God. This is down in verses 6 to 11 there. 14, 6 to 11, angel 1, angel 2. And remember, up to this point um, in time, mankind is, is never considered a personal enemy of God. But those who have been swayed and persuaded by the enemy. But now they've made their choice, they've made their decision, and if they don't repent, and if they don't proclaim, then they become a personal enemy of God. Angel number three proclaims God's wrath upon the objects of his anger. So now full judgment has now come to all of those who are left behind. Okay, full judgment now comes to those who are left behind. So the question again that, that continues to be asked, um, is there still a chance? With God, there is. With Dave, no. With God, yes. I'm thankful that I'm not God. You should be really thankful. And uh, I mean, think about how we make decisions on Man, we see something. We don't even have. We live in a world today where we see or hear something. We don't even have to have any background information. They're guilty as charged. I mean, this. I, you know, I, I keep. I'm just perplexed by this cancel culture. Um, I'm perplexed at how we can go back 20, 30 plus years, and somebody said something stupid when they were 14, 13, 16 years old. And now their life is over. Not just 
their job, their lives are over. Because now they carry that with them everywhere they go. Now stop and think about this. Because is this not like the marks that we're talking about here in Revelations? I'm not saying cancel culture is a part of Mark, Mark and Lee. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is they don't get stamped with anything. They don't have a, a, a tattoo and they don't have a barcode on but now people know who they are and they know what they've said and what they've done. And they carry that with them so people know. I was with this one actor, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. It's one that, uh, uh, oh, Chrissy Teigen. Just brutalizing, man. I'm telling you what, she told this one nine-year-old kid, do best that you slip your wrist. And I'm going, why would you say that to a nine-year-old? I mean, as an adult. And, and I think about this stuff, and I think about how crazy our world is becoming and how isolated we're becoming. We're at a place where we, we can't say anything. We, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. I mean, we become so isolated. And the pandemic didn't help us any. It pushed us farther in that isolation. But we all know through history that mankind has a way of rebelling, has a way of going back to its divine and standing up for what they believe. And I believe that we're still going to see that in the coming days. And I, I think that these people who are a part of this cancel culture and part of this holding people's past against them, they're, they're going to answer for that. And they're going to answer for it in a very real, yes, I am on live, and I'm sure if they hit the YouTube, that would have people with problems. But it's a truth. It's a truth. That we see, we see it here in the book of Revelation. Well, modern society has shown that through technology and social media and cameras and everything all around us, people um, can't outlive anything. When we were kids, if you said something, you either apologized or you moved on. I mean, there wasn't a, a little guy keeping a record of every little thing you said or everything you did. And so there Thank wasn't. Anything anyone ever said or did, we were all guilty. All of us. We just had the benefit of nobody tracking us back then. And today, it's all tracked. It's all out there. And, and it has created a, a society. Now listen, but, but, but listen, I, I still believe this is part of the enemy's ploy. I mean, he has absolutely gotten the church and Christianity at a point of shut up. And we're afraid. We're afraid to say anything. As soon as we say anything, someone's going to cancel us. I wish somebody would cancel me so the retirement would come a lot sooner than 72. But, you know what I'm saying? I mean, this is such a ridiculous world that we're living in right now. And, um, yeah, I'm off. Yeah. I'm done. I guess the second thing will be uh, shut up. They say, you know, we can't have time We don't have time for it.
He's, again, he's got so many of us so worried about mentioning God or the name of Jesus or, or salvation or, or eternal life or, you know, that, that we don't. And, and it's almost like we're going back to the days of the way where they were so afraid to talk to each other. We talked about this two weeks ago, that they would have signals, they would have signs, they would have ways of identifying each other so that you didn't step on a landmine. You know, when it came to the culture, here we are again in the exact same place. And um, it going forward won't be easy. And uh, for people who are in the pastorate or the ministry, it's going to become more and more difficult beyond a shadow of a doubt. Let's continue on here. Time has now been exhausted. Verses 12 through 20. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was seen sitting on the cloud. Notice where this angel came from. Not the head of God, but from the temple. Okay? So we see another angel here. Uh, called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap. Because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he was seated on the cloud, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. 17. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a, a sharp sickle. Still another angel, who had charge of, of the fire, came from the altar and called a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and... Gather, well, you have to be careful with that. That's a bunch of essence right there in the world. Um, gather the clusters of grapes from the earth vines because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung a single sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. They were trampled in the wine press outside the city. The blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of 1,600 so, here comes the end. Here comes it's upon us. And now, but again, I want you to remember now this is because we're going to get a little tricky when we go into Revelation 15 and we start talking about the plagues and full judgments. Because people are going to go, wait a minute, if full judgment has already come, then why are we doing this? Revelation is not chronological. Bah, 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 bah. This happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. Revelation is John appearing into the end times like this, like God does. And he's telling us things that he sees along the way. This is what I see. This is what I see. I saw this. I believe, this is my own personal opinion because that's where I, I think the hope comes from, is instead of putting this in chronological order, the Lord God had to do it like this with John because could you imagine how depressed John would have became if all he saw was endless destruction, endless death, endless despair? So he gave a little snapshot of despair and destruction, and all of a sudden, boom, he gets the pomp and circumstance. Keep him going. Remember way back in, in Revelations when John fell and he was in tears, and he said, no one. Absolutely no one in heaven or earth or under the earth can possibly save us. And then he was in such despair at that moment that that's when God handed the scroll to Jesus. And Jesus stood upon the throne with the scroll in his hand. And John came up from that depression and he's back into the hope that we have in Jesus. And I see this throughout Revelation. Every time there's this downer, there's this uplifting that happens in the midst of it. And every time this uplifting happens, it always points to the person of Jesus. Every time, all the time. 
So let's look at 12 through 20 here, the last part of our filling your blanks. Verse 12, the saints will pass through times of trouble. Now, I told you I'm a mid-tripper. So I believe the first three and a half years, we're going to be here. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a pre-tribulation person. I, I don't believe that we're going to get out of the way. I believe that we have we will endure part of this. Now, when I say we, I don't necessarily mean us here today. I'm just saying the church will endure. The people of Jesus will endure for a period of unknown time. But the realities of God's grace will sustain and strengthen them. That's why I teach the book of Revelation. For that purpose and that purpose alone. I know people today that won't even watch the news because it's so, yeah. I know people today that believe Jesus will be here tomorrow because the world is in such disarray. We got, we have to, going back to what Emmanuel said here. We have to take our eyes off how it's affecting me, my personal issues. And have to look at how is it affecting creation? How is it affecting the overall life of individuals in our world? A billion people. That's the way we have to look at these things. And so through teaching the book of Revelation and through teaching hope, not despair, destruction, and death, we have an opportunity for the word to sustain us. Regardless of what we face, regardless of what is thrown at us. If you are not going back to the word in the midst of despair, in the midst of troubles and tribulation, then I would highly recommend to get busy with God's word again. Because that's the only place you're going to draw your strength. That's the only place you're going to draw another breath of hope for the next day. Is in this. That's why I told you, I'm not a I'm not a premillennial, I'm not a mid I'm not a post-millennial, I am a pan-millennial. I believe if you know Jesus, it's all going to pan out at the end. Doesn't matter. Amen. But you got to know Jesus. So that's the that's the angle I always come from and say all the time because I, I believe it. Verse thirteen: Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Their torment and mistreatment are only temporary. Listen, you verse you heard the old saying: For those who know Jesus, this is all the hell you'll ever experience. For those who don't know Jesus, this is all the heaven they will ever experience. Because we are eternal beings. The life we live on earth is all the hell we will ever endure. For those who are in Jesus, I'm going to put that caveat in there. Just in case. The reaper of the harvest has come. The reaper. His name is Jesus. He is the reaper. In Matthew 25, 31 and 33. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, didn't we just read about that? Didn't John just testify to that? He will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, <laughs> every time I teach that Matthew passage, I get I'll get somebody who'll say, so it, is this political too? Um, if we're on the left, we're goats, and then we're on the right, we're, no. This, this is way before political unrest and knuckleheadedness came about being, okay? Um, I've, seen, I've seen churches and pastors use this. You want to know what political party you want to be affiliated with? Read Matthew 25, verse 33. Stop. Just stop. Man, that's not sowing hope. That's sowing division is all that's ever sown. So, then possibly the three from verses 6 to 11 come forth. Verses 15 and 16. Another angel came out of the temple. That is the sanctuary of God. Mark 13, 32. About that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of God, but the Father alone knows the day of time. So they're all waiting with bated breath. I mean, I can't even fathom what, what it must be like for them to look down and see what's going on here and, and waiting for them to unleash Jesus. Snap. You 
you know, on the earth. I can't even imagine my snow. It's like tonight's the night. It's a perfect day. Everybody's asleep. No one's paying attention. Um, they don't need to be paying attention. They, one angel can get us all. Okay? So, but they don't even know. So the angel comes out. That's the one angel. This angel gives the order from God to begin. Many people believe this is Gabriel. Okay? Because Gabriel is the messenger of God. So many believe this is the archangel Gabriel. The harvest in verse 15 and 16 is a general statement. It covers all inhabitants, including Israel. Okay? Everybody who's on the faith left on the face of the earth. The separation of the faithful sheep from the unfaithful who he calls goats. So this is what the angel does. Comes out of the sanctuary. He announces that things are going to happen. Things, the harvest has come. Time is up. All the inhabitants are left on earth. And he separates them between the sheep and the goats. Finally, still another angel came out of the temple place. He had a sharp sickle. Why him? To gather. This one is known, what we call as the angel of death. You know, you heard the terminology, the angel of death. Well, that's, that's what people, this is the name that they would give to him. Do I believe he's in heaven right now in the Holy of Holies? And they say, dude, death, just a minute, man, you're on, okay? No, I don't believe that for a minute. But he is the one that goes out and does the gathering. Possibly representing the call of the church and its ministers to unbelievers. This was an interesting insight that I picked up on. There will come a time where the believers will say to the unbelievers, we are all eternal beings. You are made in the image of God who is an eternal being. Which means that when we die, we will all spend eternity somewhere. It amazes me time and time again. And I've said this so many times. Hopefully, you're sick of hearing it, but you believe it. Everybody who dies thinks they're going to heaven. Everybody. I mean, it is an amazing fact. Even people who denounce God or their belief and call themselves agnostic or atheist. I've only met a couple people in my lifetime that could care less about a funeral service, but they're going, they said, right? I'm just going to be worm food, so it doesn't matter. They have no concept and don't desire to have a concept of that. But on the other hand, a majority of agnostic atheist people believe the opposite. That there is an eternal life after this. They just don't call it God or Jesus. But as we see here, that's not true. Some are called goats. And uh, that mean, does not mean greatest of all times. All right? It does not mean that. Um, either way, this is God's judgment. Verse 18, and yet another angel who had charge of fire, meaning the final judgment. This is the destiny. Hell's fires, all consuming fires. Now, what was, what's interesting here is um, in Matthew 7, 17 through 19, I'm going to read this for you. Yes, it's on the back of your papers. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, the reason I bring this up is because for those who have grown grapes, when a grape comes out, it looks like what? Good fruit, because... There it is. I can see it. I can touch it. I can taste it. If you run back to the book of Joel, I should have put that on there. Jared, I should have put on there. Um, it talks about um, the foxes that nip at the grapes. Now, let me let me take you to that passage there and explain that because I used it a few weeks ago on Sunday morning. Um, the blooms on the grapevines are the 
believers. And they produce fruit. Some of that fruit is never produced. And those grapes are all destroyed. That's the image that is painting for us. And so the book of Joel it says, why do people keep nibbling at the grapes? They're not talking about the grapes. They're talking about the blooms of the grapes. Fine. Because if you kill the bloom, you kill the grape. And that's the reference to it. And that reference had it spoke um, pretty directly to people who are uh, ministers of the word of God. And how people nip, 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 nip at them until finally they go, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not doing no more of this. You know, I'm here to try to help. I'm sure I'm here to try and encourage and bring hope. And all you do is nip, 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 nip. I used to keep a follow of nips. Um, I quit doing it about seven years ago because the file became too big. And so what I used to do, and this was encouraged by me by my first mentor. He said, now, Dave, doing this job, you're going to get all kinds of crazy comments, letters, cards, and people will hate you because they hate him. Not because of you, but because of him. Some will hate you, not because of him, because they hate you, but this is the what happens. The mud that was meant for Jesus sometimes flat on us. He said, so my advice is keep those, but start another file with all the positive things. He says, so every time you get a, a text, a, not a text back then, a card, a letter, and that was just demonstrative, then open up your ego file and read those. Then put them back. And every time you get a kind letter or a card from somebody, put it in your ego file. And then the other one put in that file. And it was amazing how big that file became. Huh? It was not a joy that they became big. Unfortunately, it was the opposite. And it was, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I would have dozens of letters and cards here telling me what I did wrong, why I did it wrong, what I said wrong. I didn't. And then over here was this file with just a few. And um, it was hard. It was so difficult. And I thought to myself, I finally threw the file away because I thought to myself, I can't make it another 10, 20 years if he, if I keep thinking of these things. And I don't want them around me. So I went to the grinder and got rid of them. I still keep the ego file. I do. I do. I, God is my witness. If someone writes me a nice card, letter, email, text, I file it away because I know the others are still coming. I know they're still coming. I discard them and I go back to the file. You know, it, it kind of like what's the name on Saturday Night Live? Remember that? You are somebody. You're good. You're kind. You're beautiful. Yes, Stuart Smalley. In the mirror. <laughs> In the mirror. Um, affirmations. Yes. Ugh, I affirm myself. Hey, listen, that's that's a tough thing. Um, you don't have to affirm yourself as a minister. God will affirm through people. And that, that's why I keep that file because here's, here's the crazy thing, man. Almost 30 years of doing this. And I can't, I can't point to very many that I, that I could say that God used me to impact and change their lives. Like, I can, I, you know, a couple dozen, yeah. But man, think of all the people that I've encountered in, in 30 years of ministry. And, um, and I'll have people that will come out and say, hey, listen, I can't, I appreciate so much what you did for me 25 years ago. Well, it, and that's beautiful. I love it, man. That's in the file you go. But the thing is, for 25 years, you never knew. And then you get that email at Christmas time I told you about from one of my disciples way back when I was youth pastor saying, I hope that my kids never, ever have a pastor like you. I hate you and what you did to me. And my family, I will never forgive you for. It's you. Where's my ego file? I had to read once that day. Hard. Very difficult. For us, it's difficult. For anybody who speaks the name of Jesus or the gospel message, it's going to be difficult. But judgment is coming. The grapes, the unfaithful, they will be destroyed. And note that God and God alone will hand out the final judgment. We know that from Isaiah 63 back to the um, Zion claim. 
It is I proclaiming victory, mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of ones treading the winepress? I have trodden, trodden the winepress alone for the nations. No one was with me. I trampled them in my own anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood splattered my garments and stained all my clothing. It was for me the day of vengeance, the year for me to redeem had come. So God tells us the final judgment is his. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about the throne judgments here coming up very soon. But I thought this was good fodder. This is good food for thought. The quantity of blood in verse 19. I, when I read stuff like this, I, don't you ever want to know what a 1600 stadia is? I mean, that, I had to know what, I know what a horse is, and I know where his bridle is, but I had to know the overall, yeah, bless you, blood quantity. So here it is. 1600 stadia is approximately 180 miles in circumference, okay? The distance between Palestine and the Holy Land, which is interesting. And as a high and as high as a horse's bridle, the average was six foot and ended the horrific scene. So you got 180 miles, six foot deep of blood. Hollywood can't write that. There's there's no way. They fail. If you went, if you went and seen a movie. With 180 miles of six foot blood, you turn it off. That's impossible. But yet, we see at the end, it was possible. So we close chapter 12 through 14 with symbolism and John's vision, telling us what will come to pass at the end of these days and at the things that will occur in human history. John envisions a time that will be marked the stress of finality and completion. That's what John said. Next week, we'll talk about the seven plagues in Revelation chapter 15. But we remember, it's not in any kind of sequential order, all right? He's telling you what he sees when he's allowed to see it. If you go back to Revelation, Revelation 4, when he was told, I want you to watch this, but don't write anything down. I mean, he's telling you when to see and what to see. And again, I think for the purpose of providing us today hope, not despair. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this night. Father, I, I pray you forgive me for any words that fell off my lips, Lord, that were not of you or that were of me. I pray that you would strike them from the hearts of all those who have listened. Lord, sometimes I do get a little carried away. I get a little speedy. And sometimes words just fly. And I want the only words to remain in our hearts are your words. Because those words give us life and set us free from the bondage of this earth. So I pray your blessings upon this night and upon this lesson and upon all who had an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say. And I ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. and Amen. You can only sleep back there so gingerly.